Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to Motor One This Week, the weekly podcast from Motor One. We're going to go over some of the most significant, coolest stories of the week, and joining me today is Senior Editor Jeff Perez. How are you doing, Jeff? Good, John. How are you? Great, thanks. And like we had last week, writer Christopher Smith. How are you doing, Chris? Doing good. What's up, my motoring friends? Not much. Now, uh, I'm going to turn to you for the first story because you've been following um, all of the Corvette news uh, that's been coming our way, as well as the GT500 news. So we talked about both cars a little last week, but in the last seven days, more news stories. So what's the the first word on the Corvette that happened this past week? The the first word on the Corvette is three million. And that's a big word. (laughs) That's well, it's a small word, actually, but it's a lot of coin. That's three million dollars. That was the auction price for the 2020 Corvette Stingray VIN 001. That is the first production car. Technically, they haven't built it yet. The car that was at Barrett Jackson is is just a, uh, um, you know, it's one of the earlier models. And uh, yeah, three million dollars. That huge money, obviously, for the Corvettes. Um, you know, it's the first mid-engine Corvette ever. It's Honestly, all bets were off as to what it might bring, just because, I mean, this is, I mean, this is like over 50 years in the making, right? And of course, it went to uh, Rick Hendrick, um, you know, big GM motorsports guy, NASCAR guy. I think he has quite a few um, Barry Jackson finds in his collection. And of course, it all went to charity, so... You know, I was wondering if for for a wealthy guy like that, you know, usually when they're at Barrett Jackson and they're buying cars, the the cars are investments, right? They're looking at it. Is it going to appreciate? Uh, am I going to make money on it? With one like this, it's got to be, you know, part, you know, this is just a good way to give the charity and part it's an investment. But I, I wonder if the first if this first C8 Corvette is really going to appreciate over $3 million over time, like $3 million is a hell of a lot of money. I mean, yeah, if he keeps it for like 90 years and it shows up in a barn somewhere, <laughs> sure. It'll be more than $3 million. Yeah, it don't, but, st- don't. So the, the takeaway here is don't store it in a nice garage, like stick it in your barn. Don't put a cover on it. That's stick how you appreciate. Yeah. That's that, how it's going to appreciate. I that's like the that best idea. way. Yeah, that's the best way to appreciate a car. But let me, let me give an example of another car. Um, that, that went for a similar price at Barrett Jackson, which was the original Bullet Mustang uh, that also sold for, I think it was $2.7 million uh, before all the fees were factored in. Uh, that was the uh, one of the original cars that was used to shoot the movie Bullet and was in a barn for a long time and resurfaced, not even restored, and it sold for $2.7 million. So these cars are going for huge money, but man, I, I, this one, I I don't know if I'm, like I said, if I'm a wealthy guy, uh, like Rick Hendrick, I I don't know what, I don't, what's my motivation to help people purely or to invest in something or both. And I wonder, does he get a tax write off for the whole thing since it goes to charity? Because that's a pretty sweet deal. I mean, you're talking about charity and, uh, and, and just to back up really quick, the, the bullet was actually at Mecham. And oh, that's uh, right. Meekum a couple and, weeks earlier, and yeah. it was it was uh, three point four mil after uh, that's before the fees. We generally like to quote not including the fees just because different auction places. I mean, they can have different commissions and whatnot. But yeah, you're right. I mean, similar money, um, and you know, a lot of people were questioning that as well. It's like, is that really an investment? I mean, it will will people twenty thirty years from now that maybe never even heard of the movie just be like what is this old green Mustang, you know? And that one, that one to me is kind of dumb. The bullet one, like that movie is already sort of outdated. Oh um, yeah. I mean, it, well, it's very outdated, but then I think it, just moves, it just moves into the realm of classic, you know, classic, yeah. a classic movie. Well, and, yeah. and I mean, when you, people that are in like the Mustang world and that muscle, that sixties muscle car world, they're the ones that are into it. And that's where a lot of the question comes from will there still be enough of those people around in yeah 20 or 30 years to to even care about this we're currently and, in a in a high watermark i think for the prices of classic american cars like muscle cars and, I, and, yeah I, I think you're absolutely right and you know whether the the c8 whether that'll be worth more than three million i mean man it, it's it's so hard to say we don't th- this is new ground for Chevrolet, this is new ground yeah. for the Corvette. This isn't just a new generation. It's a completely revamped car with the engine behind you. So, I yeah, mean, as, if, if, 
if I think the next the next five or ten years will really tell the tale if the car just turns out to be a real stinker. You know, nobody's going to care who has the first one. But if or they just out- sell or they just sell so many of them that they're not kind of exclusive and and they don't hold their prices as well. I mean, I think that happened with uh, some of the some of the other Corvettes like the C sixes and C fives. You can get for dirt cheap. Oh yeah, uh, and they're and they're great yeah. cars. They're great bang for the bucks. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen with the C8, just because it's kind of moved from the realm of sports car to kind of supercar. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll have to wait and see. It was a it was a good price. I'm glad it all went to charity. Um, that's always good news. Um, and you know, we'll probably have a big piece of Corvette news to share every week at this rate. That's how it seems, uh, seems things are going. But oh, yeah. speaking of, speaking of American cars and, and cars we talked about last week, there's, uh, another great video. The GT 500 was released this week. Why don't you tell us about that too, Chris? I mean, I've been following GT 500 as well. And, uh, and Edmonds did a, a neat lineup that everybody's been waiting for since the GT 500 finally returned. Okay. It's Detroit's big hitters. It's the... Uh, Dodge Challenger Hellcat, the 797 horsepower Red Eye, not the not the regular Hellcat, but the big one, um, against the Chevy Camaro ZL1 and the GT500. These are the top dogs for Ford, for GM, for Dodge, and Mustang wins. But it's not that simple because you're talking about once again an unprepped surface. They're just out on a on, on a big stretch of road. Yeah, what what? It wasn't a runway because it had um, it had like lane markers. So yeah, I don't know what road they were using, but yeah, it right. wasn't a drag strip. So it was kind of right. just like a an unprepped road. An unprepped road, closed conditions. Of course, I mean they're not yeah. they're not out street racing these guys. I want to be clear on that. Um, but I mean they they line them up several times and GT five hundred. Somewhat surprisingly, I think for a lot of people, um, won each contest and won it quite handily. Um, and it kind of goes back to the whole, you can have your stats on paper. That doesn't necessarily translate to the real world. And, and in fact, um, the Camaro was even very competitive with the Challenger. And I know that's, that's probably going to hurt some, uh, some yeah, of our Yeah, even though the Camaro, was, the Camaro was down on ho- horsepower to both of them, right? Right. And, and you know, that's going to hurt some of, the, some of the pride for some of the Dodge guys. But once again, you're talking about a car that really is designed to launch hard at a drag strip, um, you know, with, with the challenger and it doesn't always translate to real world. That's not saying that the challenger is like a slow boat anchored by enemies. This no, thing is but- fast. And, and, and in some of these races, the challenger got out of the hole quicker than everybody else, which is actually pretty surprising considering they're, they're trying to get that much power down. Some of the issue, um, you know, according to the video was that, Hey, you know, once things are rolling, okay, now they're really trying to make use of all that 797 horsepower. The car is still spinning its tires at like 100 miles an hour. Wow. You know, so, I mean, the GT500, I think I think this is showing GT500 is just really able to get its power to the ground a little bit better. I think, you know, when I look at those three cars, I look at the Camaro and the GT500 as cars who were very thoroughly designed to take advantage of all of their power and and every other component of the car as well together with the challenger as as we've noted before it's dodge just doing the best with what it's got that's an ancient car uh and they're putting the these monster motors in it as more of a marketing thing and to build an image so i'm not surprised that the challenger get gets beat by the gt500 even though it has more horsepower uh and i even though the the camaro lost the race as i'm impressed it did as well as it did um i just like seeing it i mean man to have <laughs> to have three uh three american muscle cars with that much horsepower uh, drag racing side by side by side. Uh, super, super cool to watch. And well, fit- it's interesting. I was, I would say that the, the Challenger is obviously built for straight lines, right? That's always been its purpose. Um, the ZL1 Camaro is kind of more of a track car than yeah. both of them, I think. Um, but then the Shelby's like right in the middle. So the Shelby is super good on the track, but they also really emphasize like quarter mile times. Yeah. So, it's not totally shocking to me that the Shelby won because that thing is stupid quick in a straight line. And I, I, and I got to give Ford credit, you know, has the as we were leading up to the uh, to you know to the first drives for the GT500, finally getting seat time. Ford was saying, "Hey, we've designed this car to outrun the Challenger, the drag strip, outhandle the Camaro on the track. We still haven't really seen 
Well, I take that back. We have seen some GT500 track performance uh, against the Porsche 911 GT3. I got to give Ford credit. It seems like the car does exactly what they were saying it's going to do. It, yeah, it, it's, it, it's it does. Much, it, it does both well. It does both straight line speed. And uh, I think while it's not as good in the corners as like the, the Porsche 911 you just referenced, it holds its own. It holds its own well enough to keep up. Um, and that's, you know, all around. I think it's all around a better car than either the Camaro or the Challenger. I think you guys give the Challenger too much credit when you say it was designed for straight line speed, though. I don't think it was designed for anything. I think that is riding on on just really good product planning right now. And they're just shoving bolts and parts. They're bolting parts to it and bigger motors, like whatever they can to get them out the door. Yeah, and they're, but John- they're fun, but I don't think they're they, they don't have engineers like pouring over how well I, maybe they maybe they do i i, I but there, there is a lot of engineering that went into the demon to make it oh lift the its, demon lift sure its, lift its front wheels off the ground For and sure. i mean i mean it's still a challenger yeah. you can you can still bolt up slicks and uh right. and tweak the suspension a little bit on pretty much any challenger and get it to do that i'm so, just saying so, that dodge isn't putting the development dollars into the challenger that ford's putting into the gt500 or chevy into the camaro like the, oh, they're, uh, those budgets are wildly different um so uh, well, let's keep moving. Um, Jeff, I want to turn to you because you were at the the debut of the new GMC Yukon, which we talked about last week, and this really weird feature popped up that they're going to offer. Um, it's called a hurricane turn. Uh, what is a hurricane turn? Yeah, so a hurricane turn essentially just allows you to spin the Yukon in circles if you're on mud or snow or something like that. Um, if you remember a few weeks ago, Rivian had a video where they announced a take a tank turn feature for their pickup, which is essentially the same thing, where it just spins in a circle and it uses the electric motors at each wheel to spin the wheels individually. I guess the front wheels go one way and the back wheels go another Actually, way. I and think it just, it's the, the driver's side wheels go one way and the right. passenger side wheels go one way. So in the yeah. Rivian's case, it's spinning completely in place. Like it's mm-hmm. not a donut where it's going in a circle. It's like it's like... Twi- right, twirling. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. like 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 a skid steer. Which actually, that's where they get the name skid steer. You'll have one side going in one direction, the other side going in the other direction. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so GMC oddly didn't announce this at the launch. They didn't talk about it at all um, until someone asked someone from Motor Trend asked, and they said uh, they called it a hurricane turn, which is essentially the same thing as the Rivian. Though obviously it's a little different because. The Yukon is still, you know, a gas-powered vehicle, and it doesn't have an electric motor on each wheel. So the way they do it is you essentially turn off the stability control, you crank the wheel all the way to one side, and you just hammer the gas. And I guess when you do that, you don't really have to push any buttons. When you do that, the car sort of knows what you're doing. So it'll lock up the brakes, depending on which way you're going, to keep the car you know, in a right. perfect so it'll, I, circle. F- from what I understand, like, let's say you you um, jerk the wheels all the way to the left mm-hmm. and floor it. It'll break the two wheels on the driver's side, on the left. Right. And with, yeah. and then the wheels on, on the passenger side will be turning and basically, like, dragging that side of the vehicle around the, the center point. Um, yeah, exactly. That, it's kind of, like, I don't, I don't know why I would ever need that other than to, like, play around with and, and have fun with friends in, like, a muddy field or something. Um, I, I don't know that it serves a purpose. And same thing with the Rivian. Like, other than a novelty, uh, I don't know what that really does. Um, it looks fun. It does. And I think that's okay. <laughs> like, in this world of, uh, you know, uh, Tesla coming out with these kind of surprise and delight features, like playing games in your car. or Like, I, I actually like it when a company like Rivian just throws something in there that's like, you know, this is a new era and we're using new technology that can do cool things like this, you know, mm-hmm. and like, I don't know what that's going to do, but you guys go have fun with it, fun well, with it and weird. figure it out. And from it's a practical weird. standpoint, too, I mean, uh, if, if you have a big vehicle and you have a very small area to turn, I, I mean, there, there is some practical use to it there, um, as, as long as it's not just slinging all around like. Know, like maybe some I don't of know the Yukon yeah. back Yukon in, the, sign, in the 90s with all-wheel drive cars that I never did anything like that with the Yukon sounds like it's not something you're going to be able to like get out of a tight spot with like you're you're flooring it to, to get it to work so it's like it's like a presentation it's like theater uh the Rivian one you might be able to do slowly the torque probably helps in the Rivian because you could just sort of feather the throttle a little bit and spin it 
Just yeah, the, yeah. Under whereas control. the Yukon, it's yeah, the Yukon, it, it would be hard. But it's weird to me that they didn't like announce this, or they didn't show any video at the launch, or they didn't even show a video after the fact. Like they probably saw Rivian do it and was like, "Oh, that's cool. We need to like do that, or we have that, but we didn't think to like show a video See, of it." This is the difference to me between a, like a startup automaker like Rivian and Tesla and a legacy automaker like GM. You know, the the startups see that as something to get attention for and, and show that they're fun and, you know, to get a lot of play out of. And and a, and a legacy automaker just lets it slide right by. Like no one would have ever noticed unless mm-hmm. somebody had had asked about it and made a big thing. And they actually got a lot of attention. You know, we wrote about it. Everybody wrote about it um, after it came out. And they yeah, they didn't say anything. They would have just let it go and, and just, you know, had the 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 Yukon debut. And I have to say yeah. like the Yukon debut was pretty yawn yawn. I mean, it, you mm-hmm. know, that we the Tahoe had already debuted, so we kind of knew what all the mechanicals would be, you know, we yeah. I guess we got to see what the Denali version looked like, but you know, there wasn't some big news that came out of it that made us, you know, made us all talk about it until the next day when this hurricane turn thing popped up. So yeah, I would have mm-hmm. made a much bigger deal out of it. Uh, yeah. Than they well, had. the AT the AT four was the only other big news that the, that the AT four is going to be on the Yukon for the first time, which is their you know off road trim essentially. So I would think that Hurricane Turn would be specific to that trim. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Like I want to hear more from them about why it's even on there. Is it going to be mm-hmm. on the Chevy products? Uh, is it going to be yeah, on other vehicles, question. or is it like specific to the Yukon for some reason? I don't know. Oh man, and I want to try it. I mean, we need to get on a first drive and. Crank Could you the imagine wheel. an Escalade with that? I know, or or even like the Yukon <laughs> XL, like swinging that yeah. rear end around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, all right. Well, we'd love to hear what you guys think about these stories so far. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at motor one com, uh, where the discussion about these stories and more will continue. And of course on our website, motor one.com, you can find us in the comments. Uh, before we head to a quick break, I want to remind everybody that you can get our show on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, and Spotify. So hit the subscribe button. So you get us every week. Now, the news this week is that the Santa Cruz could get a diesel engine, um, which is a pretty big deal. Um, you know, a lot of vehicles in the U.S., a lot of trucks in the U.S., uh, light uh, light duty trucks are getting uh, diesel engines these days. Uh, the reason Hyundai might have one available for the Santa Cruz is because they just debuted the Genesis GV80 SUV. And in other markets outside the U.S., that will have a three-liter uh, inline-six diesel engine, and it produces 278 horsepower and 443 pound-feet of torque. So it's a it's a really nice bruiser; would fit really well in a truck. Uh, and an Australian uh, outlet called Car Sales asked uh, the head of Hyundai's R&D. Uh, what they were going to use this engine for. And he replied, basically, we plan to use it in a lot of things uh, in so many applications. Um, So he didn't outright say it could go in this vehicle, but it definitely makes sense as one of the top candidates. The question, though, is would Hyundai sell that version in the U.S. or will Hyundai stick with a gas only truck in the U.S.? Um, You know, when we wrote the article, we speculated um, that they probably wouldn't sell it with a diesel in the U.S. just because, you know, after diesel gate and and all of that, the the bad reputation. But I don't know. There's so like I said, there's so many half ton and midsize pickup trucks that are coming out with diesel engines these days that I think it's at least a possibility as like a higher priced optional engine. Um, probably not as like the only base engine because that would make the the Santa Cruz probably much more expensive than its rivals, uh, you know, from like a base price perspective. But I definitely see, you know, as like a range topping version offering a diesel engine. Um, have you guys driven any of the truck, the, the newer trucks lately with a diesel, with a diesel engine? Yeah, I drove the, um, I've driven the Colorado with the diesel. In general, I, I tend to like the diesel ones better. I think more truck appropriate, more torque, just better. But yeah, they are a little pricey. Mm -hmm. Well, and the Santa Cruz is going to be a body on frame truck. It's uh, not going to be a unibody. So it's, it will have the beefy mechanicals to do towing and, and to pair that with a a diesel would be smart. In my mind, I thought a unibody truck would actually make more sense for Hyundai. I I think it would too. But, um, according to our report, it's, uh, 
going to be body on frame. So keep in mind too, Hyundai makes a lot of commercial vehicles. So they may be using this platform uh, in other ways and they're just sharing it with the Santa Cruz that there could be lots of reasons why they chose to go that route. But, um, you know, I mean, most of the other midsize pickups are body and frame as well. Um, you know, the Hon- uh, Honda Ridgeline being the exception maybe. Um, but it, it, it's going to be a, hot, it's already a very hotly contested segment, uh, almost too hotly contested. Like I think all, all of the competitors have divided up the market to where they all have lost sales uh, more than they thought. Like a clear win, like the Tacoma, I think it's still largely in the lead up there with the the Colorado, but I don't think they're selling quite as many as they all thought they were. Well, they probably look at the US market and think that the typical American truck buyer um, doesn't want a unibody truck. And I mean, you can't blame them. Yeah, I mean, they're they're right. That's, I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 see, I see that as absolutely why they're going with body on frame and i suspect they're also watching uh diesel sales very closely to see if maybe it makes sense in the u.s market yeah whether they're whether they're too late or not i mean that's that's it's a good point but it could also be debatable i mean if they come out with a good product you know also the the uh, brand new nissan frontier is on the way as well which that thing is super old but still sells surprisingly well because it's so much less expensive than the other mid-sized trucks there's only one other unibody truck the ridgeline so because like i said i don't think the sales of mid of the mid-sized truck segment is as large as the automakers projected it would it would be um, all right, let's move on to our last news story. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty big one. Jeff, I'll throw it over to you. It's about Subaru. Go ahead and tell us. Yeah, so Subaru this week debuted a new electric crossover, and uh, it sort of previews the future for the brand. All of their lineup is going to be electrified by the mid-2030s. So I think it's an interesting look at what, what to expect. Yeah, you know, I, I look at Subaru, and they're, they have only dabbled with electrification. The only things they've done... Uh, have to do with with the um, Crosstrek. And they did a hybrid version, uh, which they don't sell anymore. The The version they sell now, they call the Crosstrek hybrid, but it's actually a plug-in hybrid. And it's basically just the, the powertrain from the Toyota Prius Prime shoved into the, um, the XV Crosstrek, uh, which is kind of cool because you get a vehicle that has a little ground clearance and all-wheel drive. Uh, but it only has like 17 miles of range. So it's, it's not a robust plug-in uh, electric at all. Um, and Subaru becomes the latest in a long line of automakers that have made public their electrification plans. And they're pretty bold, um, you know, all electrification by uh, by 2030. So that's either all elect- uh, cars that are all electric or, or are hybrid to some degree. Um, it's just such a bold claim because they haven't done anything on their own. It's all been through partnerships with Toyota and aside Toyota is so funny when it comes to electrification because they were the Kings of traditional hybrids and they completely swore off that the future was going to be pure electric vehicles. And they put all their chips on hydrogen vehicles. And as everyone is clearly able to see, hydrogen vehicle hydrogen fuel cell vehicles aren't taking off and toyota it still seems like it's pushing against uh, a future of pure electric vehicles so they definitely like applied their hybrid drivetrain around their lineup and had some 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 success with that you know people liked the camry hybrid uh people liked the rav4 hybrid they actually did you may not remember this but they actually had a partnership with tesla and they sold a rav4 ev pure electric with tesla batteries that uh, there's still a contingent of people who love those things. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, but it still felt like other manufacturers sort of surpassed absolutely. them, right? Like after the Prius, almost playing catch up. So I think now with his partnership with Subaru, which the two of them partnering up, I think is a good thing. Not something I thought I would have said five years ago. Well, imagine like, like take the optimist point of view and imagine how good some Subaru vehicles could be with electrification. So I'm talking about like a WRX, that's either a hybrid or even a pure electric WRX, you know, like, oh, that would be so awesome. And, and you know, I, I can't remember who it was, but I think some 
at least one automaker has developed an, an a pure electric rally car. And I could see like Subaru taking, the, you know, electrification in that direction and showing like, look, um, here's another form of motorsport that uh, pure electric cars can excel in because they're already doing it in like open wheel racing and, and other areas. So I think there's some huge opportunities for Subaru to advance as a brand with electrification. But yeah, and the Crosstrek is such a good way to start. Uh, that's such a good car. Why didn't this have a plug like the whole time, you know? Yeah, it's super, it's it's a super popular vehicle, although I think the Outback probably sells the most for them. But um, so, I, yeah, I'd like to see quickly the, you know, electrification expand to plug-in hybrid versions of other vehicles. The problem, though, is at least what Toyota's never had a plug-in hybrid with decent all-electric range. Um, you know, it's, it's only been the Prius prime really. And that's top, like I said, that's tops out at like 19, 20 miles. It drops to like 17 miles in the cross track because of the all wheel drive that saps more power. Um, like I'd like to, you know, to, to, in my world, like 30 miles of all electric range is what I need for a plug in hybrid to be practical because from, at least for me, my simple errands that I do in most days could be covered by 30 miles and then I can recharge again. If it's seven, 17 miles, I'm, I mean, I'll charge it every night, but I'm going to go through that in most errands I do. All right. Well, that's our show for today. Um, you can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at CH writing. Uh, you can follow Jeff Perez at not a boat captain and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys for being on this week's episode with me. And of course, thank you all out there for listening. We'll see you next week.